holes in two bars. And that's what those bars represent. They represent the reaping and the transmuting of souls. Now, I, I, I consider this the utter madness, the work of people who are severely mentally ill. But if you are going to address an enemy, you have to understand the thinking of the enemy. Because this is the smugness of the Lord's and the arrogance of those chief justices and the self-satisfaction of those satanic leaders because they believe their magic is working. They believe their magic will continue. So unless you understand how they think and what they've done, then there's no way that we can find balance and this end of this madness. So now we see a symbol, G, a compass, Venice, a square, London. We have the symbol of the corporation of the crown, the corporation of London, the, the crown temple. What are the dates then of the Sesta KV for the uh, soul? We spoke about that, the souls, 2001. Let's talk about the slaves, the second crown. Is there a pattern there? Well, there is a pattern. Uh, the pattern is that um, the second crown, Attorney Regis, was the crown of Aragon, and the most significant office that was created under that crown <clears throat> was the office of the first admiral and governor of the Indies, the slaves. And guess who was the first admiral and governor of the slaves, a fellow by the name of Christopher Cohen or Christopher Corumba, otherwise known as Christopher the Dove. Christopher the Dove? Well, Columbus, Columbia means dove. Dove is sacred to Kai Bell. Just a bit of, bit of, uh, bit of trickery there in, in using that. It's a nickname. But what's important is the office the office of the first admiralty, the office of the first governor of the slaves, and, and it's in that title that was created by the Vatican under the crown of Aragon. Well, where do we see the word uh, admiral? Where do we see the governor? Where do we see the fees that continue to be paid for the use of the slaves? Well, we, we see it under Christopher the Dove, Christopher Columbus. <clears throat> but is there anywhere else we know of that has the name Dove? Anywhere else we know of that appears to be fully operating under the rules of maritime and, surprise, surprise, admiralty? Well, I'm sure you, you know of a place. It's called Columbia or more importantly, the District of Columbia. So if we look at that pattern of 70 years Sesta KV cycles, what do we see? 1591, 70 years to 1661, 70 years to 1731, and then we see a transfer, if not earlier, because we haven't done enough research yet, in terms of... Uh, Washington in 1801, the first organic act, then it morphs into the second United States, District of Columbia, in 1871, and then it morphs again in uh, 1941 with subsequent acts to become the United States of the world but the beginnings of it is in 1941. And then it's due for renewal in 2011, next year. Well, you knew what happened when they renewed the Sesta KV cycle in 2001. What happened then? Well, what's going to happen in 2011 then? Well, how do we know then that this is true? If the District of Columbia is now the office of the first admiralty, of the governor, of the slaves, then what we would expect to see is some apparatus that is collecting the, the 
Well, the taxes there, the taxes, the ties for using the slaves. Is there any vehicle in the District of Columbia that we have found that unmistakably is collecting taxes for the franchising use in the other estates of uh, the ownership of the flesh in the form of income taxes in terms of taxing the use of slaves? Well, of course there is. We call it the IMF. And what is their collection agency? Well, it's called the IRS. So it's all in front of us. And the significance is we missed 2001. 2001 was a wake-up call. Rather than the renewal of their system, they have started to collapse their own system. But we're coming up to 2011 next year. So our ability to uh, change and wake up and become competent is an integral part of of understanding and helping uh, these changes. So over over the next few days and few weeks, I, I hope to be able to post this kind of information up on the different websites and help you refer to them. And obviously you can listen back to the call tonight and share this information with others. But it's all around us. And when someone says to you, this is absurd, I'm not a slave, I'm a free man. What is free? Well, I'm not a slave, I'm a sovereign. What is a sovereign? A higher form of slave. Or I, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor. This is all conspiracy rubbish. Don't, don't push the point. You, you, you do the research. It's there in plain sight. People don't want to know. And at the end of the day, it doesn't require everyone to wake up. It just requires a few good people to stand. Just a few to stand up and actually be trustees, be what is written in holy book, uh, texts like the Bibles. Re just simply stop being slaves. And if a few do that, and they do it with intent, and they do it with the knowledge that we're talking about, then it can change the whole system. Because the whole system is based on the fact that no one escapes. No one. Well, I've spoken then a bit about some of the things we've spoken about in um, latest research. But I, I want to, before we get into the step-by-step -step of the ecclesiastical deed polls, because I know this is all great, but people are facing immediate problems at the moment in terms of the court. And I want to give some insight to that. But before I do that, I want to, I want to add one more thing that kind of hopefully gives you some insight into why UK is the way it is, why the covenant is, and it deals with the concept of what is a deed and what is property. So I am going to be able to now reference uh, one of the sites and I'm going to go to 1-O-N-E-Heaven. You'll probably hear some typing because I'm typing it myself. 1-Heaven, I'm going to go to the articles, uh, the canons of positive law, and I'm going to go down to, uh, where are we? I'm going to go down to Article 131 Deed and Canon 1523. So I'm just going to read Canon 1523 and then I'm going to read Canon 1525 and explain the importance of this. Because I know one of the objections that people have is, who wrote these canons? Why, why is this the law? And, and I'll answer it by reading these canons and explaining the, the significance. So Canon 1523. A deed is a form possessing certain ecclesiastical authority and record of an action of conveyance that bestows or surrenders one or more rights by agreement. Hence, a deed through proper authority and action of conveyance creates valid title to use of property. Well, there's a lot of words there and it sounds pretty technical, so it may not be obvious. So let's read 1525, which adds flesh to that canon. 1525, okay. As all ownership of property is ultimately derived from the divine creator, and we've spoken about this on previous calls, the divine creator is the only one that ultimately can own property. That's 
the nature of the fiction of property, right of use. As all ownership of property is ultimately derived from the divine creator, a valid deed always possesses the appropriate level of ecclesiastical authority representing either an approved action permitted by divine law or specifically approved by an ecclesiastical representative in accordance with these canons. Okay, what do we mean here? Well, if the divine is ultimately the owner of all property, then when property is conveyed, doesn't it make sense that there needs to be some divine approval? Of course, there needs to be divine approval. Because if all property ultimately is sacred, and all property ultimately is owned by the divine, then there must be some medium that validates that process and ensures that the process has divine approval. And that is the deed. And that is why notaries are used most often in the validation of non-standard conveyance. If it is a significant conveyance, like land title, then the Roman system makes absolutely sure that you use standard form and an ecclesiastical representative. Now, in case you don't think that notaries are ecclesiastical, you might want to go and have a look at the concept of apostolic proto-notaries, proto-notaries as well. There's both proto with a T-H and proto with just a T. They are ecclesiastical Roman officials. They are part of the Vatican apparatus. So, it makes sense then. Well, there is actually a role that is more powerful than a notary in their system, and it is the office of the cleric. If we've gone to court, or I should say the a trading floor of a large private bank, because that's what they are, they're bank officers, we've probably encountered a cleric being the clerk. And just to let you know how powerful those are, <clears throat> when you go to court in a foreclosure and you think that you've nailed them because you've exposed their fraud, that clerk can... Uh, sign a deed poll and assign that property to a smaller commercial bank anytime they like. They have that power. And unless you can match or, or, or uh, show superior ecclesiastical authority, that's it. The rest of that is, is often for show. You're just there to witness their power. It's just extending the torture. So we're probably going to run out of time of talking about foreclosures tonight, but I would like to, in a future talk show, talk a bit about foreclosures in light of this knowledge. So a deed is a critical part of the system. Well, back to that question, back to that concern about canons, where people say, why do we need canons? Why, why, who wrote these and, and why is this the law? Well, I've said this before, but it's important to remind again. A canon is just a fancy word for standard, norm, uh, measure, rule of law. So canons is a claim of rule of law. The, the Vatican already claims rule of law. And in the absence of a mirror, their rules are the rule of law. And that is why the courts, in their second form, operate under canon law, maritime law. So unless you present canon law as a mirror, you're not going to see a change in the rule of law. You just won't. But when you present it, let's reflect on what people uh, want to see in rule of law. Well, people say time and time again, no one stands between me and the vine. No one. You know, I, I have rights. I'm a living being. The blood flows, the flesh lives. Yes, this is true. But how do we make this manifest? We make it manifest by ensuring that your rights are protected. Your rights can't be protected if we don't make it clear. They claim your soul, an absolute absurdity. But the gap which allows them to do that is our failure to define what the soul is. It's not good enough to simply say, oh, well, it's something that God gave me. I mean, that's what they want us to do. They want us. These are... Lawyers that argue. The logic may be corrupt, the logic may be evil, 
but they're using principles of argument, principles of rhetoric. Uh, 